Welcome to Radical Trips. We fucked up again. We are in Belarus and behind us is Ukraine with no border control. How is that possible? It took us three hours to get into Belarus and it took us one second to get out of Belarus. But then there was a military blockade. We would like to go in Ukraine. And the guy said, it's Chernobyl, go back. But to be clear, Google sent us through. I even checked on Wikipedia for which border crossings were legit, but apparently you can interpret this one also for another one, which is a few kilometers away. But tomorrow we will actually go back to Chernobyl, this time with a guide. So stay tuned. trips what a trip this was and while we were incredibly tired the whole day uh, more on that later uh, witnessing Chernobyl was incredible the scale the compassion but also the serenity and while we will get back to our story let's take a step back first and consider what Chernobyl is exactly? Is it a place of horror and death? Is it a time capsule? Is it a refuge for nature? Or perhaps even a tourist attraction? Karel and I found out that it is all of these things. And nowadays over 10,000 international tourists visit the disaster site every year overtaken by greenery and wildlife. It documents the catastrophic blunder that helped bring down the Soviet Empire. And its last leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, has said as much. The meltdown was perhaps the real cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union five years later. The explosion released over 400 times as much radioactive material as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And while in Chernobyl at first only 31 people died, if we count radiation related illnesses, the total number of deaths reaches up to 4,000. And even in 2019, Chernobyl continues to raise headlines, now with a new miniseries released by HBO. Seen from the eyes of the first responders and powerful leaders in government, it shows how not only the dark truth and responsibilities were covered up, but it also shows how it all could have been prevented in the first place. and I are on top of the building in a desolated town near the Chernobyl reactor. Nobody lives here because it's too dangerous. I asked the tour guide, why are you here every day? And you get the sad answer, Ukraine is a poor country and money is more important than safety. Rens and I are not afraid because radiation is normal for modern human life because if you take an airplane from Amsterdam to New York you get a lot of radiation. It's no problem because you don't do it every day and we don't do this every day. But it's it's sad that we are here in a town where really nobody lives. Look at all those empty buildings. All of this area has been contaminated for 50,000 up unto 100,000 years. So on a human scale, that's 
unimaginable. Sector 3 will be inhabitable after 50 years, if I remember correctly, something like that. And the buffer zone, luckily, has been um, changing in boundaries for some time now, every now and then, if new measurements get published. And uh, slowly, actually, people get to go back to their hometowns after the disaster 32 years ago. And I know it's 32 years ago easily because I was born only three months after the disaster took place. So all of this misery and this disastrous impact on the whole world, Europe specifically, has been around for as long as I have been. So what's also what also blows the mind is that a lot of particularly old people chose to head back into their own houses already right after the incident happened due to sentimental reasons, just refusing to give up their home where they have been all their lives, but also due to bad risk assessment, I would say, due to very poorly given information from the then government USSR. They weren't properly educated about the real threats that they are related with radiation infection. So these people also were naive in many ways for decades scattered across the area, they remained within the Chernobyl zone. Many things can be said of Soviet rule and the USSR, but in all respects, as we can now also witness being in the swimming pool with the gymnasium next door, this was a real town, you know, 50,000 people had rather remarkably good lives, actually, because they were employed with the chemical plant. They had rather high salaries being engineers and sporting staff. So especially for Soviet rule back in the days of communism, particularly Piripat and Chernobyl were thriving places. And the amusement park, where we will go next, was set to open in five days after the disaster took place. If this isn't disaster tourism, then nothing is. And in some ways it reminds me of being in Auschwitz, in Poland, world's most famous concentration camp, where it made me feel rather disturbed, but also fascinated about what disasters humankind can um, and cause amongst each other. So it's rather weird to hopefully respectfully um, witness this place and try to ask good questions and take it all in. And we're here for tourism, for amusement, maybe. How do you feel about this place having turned from a disaster area into um, a tourism area. So basically we do the sightseeing tours where you can see the true picture what's going to happen to the planet after humans just disappear. That's the best spot, especially here in Pripyat town. You can clearly see how nature started to take everything over. And that's what basically people all are interested in to see what's going to happen after humans yeah, disappear. City Council, music school, cinema, river prepaid. Prepaid town was named after the river prepaid. Well, Carol, up to you to find the 10 differences. Number one. Trees. Trees. <laughs> Number two. Land post, people, broken windows. I think we are at 10 already.
how do you feel and also for your guides perhaps to work in this zone even though you go here maybe every day Hello, honestly saying that once a year we pass medical examination in the exclusion zone and we have personal radiation recorders, all of us, plus we keep all those Geiger counters. And the thing is, the risk these days basically is represented by soil. So during cleanup, all the radioactivity and radioactive dust that landed on the walls, on the roofs, on the asshole, they were washed on the soil. Yeah, And then Soviet authorities tried to remove the soil like to some extent, especially in the most important parts of this area where uh, which they plan to use for the future works. Uh, they removed the soil, they buried it, and these days, yeah, there are many still radioactive particles there. As long as you don't touch the soil, as long as you don't eat those vegetables or fruits that grow here, everything is going to be fine. So, yeah, there is no risk of, like, the risk of inhaling something here is very, very negligible. This town was also remarkable due to the very low average age of people living here. It was only 27 years old. And especially those days, maybe still in Ukraine, uh, young people tend to have a lot of young children. Of the 50,000 inhabitants, almost 17,000 of those people were small children. So there were just daycare centers and schools all around. This place makes for some awesome photography. The disturbing nature of the scene with all these laid down objects of the children that were in the daycare, it's far from authentic. And that kind of bugs me because with all that happened here, it's rather odd to me that now also photographers have created their own little reality know how to properly call on emotions of empathy and distress and loss but that makes it more into a theme park than into an actual historical preserved location and for me that goes a little bit too far we don't touch anything especially while we're urban exploring we do believe in the credo leave nothing but your footsteps so setting up these scenes by selectively placing or even bringing children's toys in order to create a morbid picture, that's not our style. Have you encountered members of your tour group uh, misbehave, maybe in uh, disrespectful ways? Uh, these days, no. In the past, yeah, there were some cases when people tried, like for example, to get on the Ferris wheel or on that, uh, uh, on those swingers or inside the bumper cars. But people just need to understand, and like when they are coming here, they need to respect the place, the place where thousands of people used to live and stuff like that. Some of them tried to break the windows because they wanted to do that for fun, but what the purpose, you know? You just need to come and respect the place and the land where people used to live. Yeah, I was born in 1989, but I was, yeah, I was born after the disaster, but my family used to live in a tiny village that was located some 80 kilometers from this place. And uh, when Soviet Union collapsed and when Ukrainian authorities started to change the borderlines of the exclusion zone, uh, they detected that there was some increased radioactivity in the settlement where my family used to live. I was uh, back then five years old. Yeah, it was 1994. Uh, when we were relocated from the settlement due to increased radioactivity and we were just provided another accommodation 
And my grandfather, he was one of those liquidators who participated during liquidation, during cleanup of the exclusion zone after the disaster. Yeah, he died pretty early at the age of 39, but it happened to many of those liquidators who were here, especially first few weeks after the disaster. During, during the year, there are some days, they are called as memorial days in the exclusion zone, when former inhabitants of this territory are allowed to come and visit the graves of their family members or friends who were buried here. So basically on those days, my family, like my uh, parents and my grandmom, they go to visit the grave of my grandfather. And that's the only day when they just basically go there. In the first three hours after the explosion, 28 firefighters went to the reactor and try to save it for another explosion. If the second reactor exploded, then half of Europe wouldn't be here. So it was a remarkable job and those firefighters saved the life of almost every European being. You might remember the video of Tropical Islands in Germany. This place is huge. It's really humongous. The Eiffel Tower can lie on its back. The Statue of Liberty can fit straight in. Well, this one has a dubious record of being even bigger while being movable. Because over there, which I cannot show, but I can't film that part, right? But no, we cannot take photo of the physical protection security area. Oh, I see. Yeah. There's rail tracks. And on these rail tracks, they could move the whole sarcophag in 14 days time from where they could safely construct it for over five years with the help of 3000 construction workers. It cost a total of 2.5 billion euros built by a French company and it should last for over 100 years. This should keep us safe while robots have 40 meters to spare with the 70 meters of the actual power plant. And within these 40 meters, the robots will help us to clean up the mess that humans created. Hopefully in a century from now, the sarcophag can also be removed again and we will be safe from radiation. We have one story left to tell you guys. This very night, at the border crossing from Belarus into Ukraine, not the first one, uh, the warm one at the Chernobyl area, the other one, the proper one, got us into a lot of trouble. It was already midnight, and at the Ukrainian side of the border, we saw 15 cars waiting. It was going to be a long night. Once, it was our turn, and we were able to talk to a border officer. We knew we were in trouble. It had nothing to do with our equipment, but with the car. The thing is, this isn't my car. It's for my father, and Rens and I used it for years for many of the radical trips, road trips. And of course, I have the official car papers but they want to have a written statement with a stamp on it and a signature that I am allowed to drive in this car. Of course, I don't have it. It was never a problem before, but they have found something to bug us with. It became evident to me when she said to us, guys, you have very expensive equipment. Why do you come in my country? Without papers, you give me a lot of trouble. I don't earn much. It will take a lot of time for me to fix this. Rens was waiting in the car and I was traveling from one office to another office, to one guy with a star, to someone higher up with two stars and a big head. If we were in trouble because we couldn't travel to the Ukraine, but our visa expired at midnight, so we couldn't go back to Belarus as well. We were stuck 
in limbo with every time the same question why don't you have the right papers? Why don't you have the right papers? Why do you come to my country without the right papers? You bring me in trouble. I apologize. I never should come to a country without the right kind of papers. And then it came to me, it was just blackmail. So I asked her if I could compensate it for her time to give her 50 euros. You should understand where I come from, we don't do bribes. Maybe in some places it is normal, but not for me, so I was scared. The only English sign on the wall said, if you bribe, you go to jail. I thought the situation was solved, but then the door opened, the guy with the big head and the two stars came into the room. She was definitely shocked and my heart rate went through the roof. She took the money, put it in the passports and I was so afraid. What will happen now? Does the senior guy take my passport, see the bribe, will they put us in jail? And luckily after 30 seconds the guy left the room. She took the money out of the passport, hid it under the computer, she took our border papers, gave it a stamp on it and said, go now, fast. The adrenaline was racing through my body. It was four o'clock in the morning. We had a drive of two hours left to Kiev. We will be arriving there at six. Our tour guide will pick it up at seven. I didn't have time to sleep. It was a long day, awake for more than 40 hours. Terribly tired, had a fantastic day, bribed my first officer, I hope it would be my last. And Chernobyl was amazing. I'm so happy I done it all. Let's go back to the hotel. Quick update. We are now in a burger bar. The only thing I want to say, I knew a lot about Chernobyl. But the story today amazed me even more because there were fire fighters and with their lives, they presented an even bigger catastrophe for the whole continent because when there was another reactor exploding, maybe half of Europe wasn't visible anymore. Very important. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. But even today, and luckily the end is near, with the robots kicking in from next year onwards, very brave and strong people are still working to help us be safe. So I'm very glad the Ukrainian government has taken the steps in the past few years to allow visitors to share in the story and to learn from the mistakes from the past, so we won't make them again. This was Radical Preps, and I hope to see you next time. The only thing better than a burger is a double burger.